Hi everyone, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm very excited to present you this work in progress and at this stage to interrupt our raise questions or suggestions. Uh, so this paper is about households with carbon footprints and I'm gonna try to convince you that uh, food emissions matter, that there is heterogeneity in terms of food emissions and that uh, they can be affected by purchasing power shocks. So let's start with emissions. Uh, so in, um, in many countries, uh, food uh, consumption represents a significant share of households' carbon emissions. For instance, in France, it would be about 25%. And in the US, it's slightly lower, but uh, roughly the same magnitude. And uh, what's, con what's polluting actually is not really the consumption. It is rather the production. So farm, land use, uh, processing that you may have in mind. But there is research showing that solely focusing on supply side measure, improving the technology, for instance, would be insufficient to meet climate mitigation targets. And this is why we need to uh, look at food demand and see how we can uh, change it to limit uh, global warming. However, food is not only a matter of emission, it is uh, mainly the result of purchasing power of budget constraint and preferences. Indeed, food represents a large share of household expenditures. In France, it would be about 16%. In the US, roughly uh, the same thing, although slightly lower. And as I said, it is shaped by preferences. Everyone likes different kinds of food and budget constraints because uh, as you know, uh, one can only uh, spend uh, one share of their budget uh, on food. So food is actually strongly affected by income shocks. And we are going to wonder in this paper what would be the consequences of those shocks on food emissions and how do consumers with different emission profiles are going to respond to those shocks. And this heterogeneity is important because this is gonna, um, we can derive the distributional cost of uh, carbon taxation if you want to implement that, for instance. And uh, it can really uh, impact um, households consumption. So in this project, we're looking at the effect of purchasing power variation on households food emissions. And first, this requires to study food carbon footprint heterogeneity in depth and at a granular level. I'm going to provide evidence from France uh, using um, that I derived from a matching of purchase data with environmental data at very fine level, that is the transaction level. I'm going to show to you that even in a sector where uh, for a budget item that everyone needs to consume in their daily lives, uh, there is significant heterogeneity with the top quartile of emitters polluting or being um, attribute. We can attribute them uh, about half of total food emissions, and that there is surprisingly perhaps no correlation between income and food emissions. Then I will turn to the estimation of um, a demand model in order to study the reaction to our food emissions to price and expenditure changes that represent our purchasing power shocks. I will uh, show you how we can estimate this model, that there is heterogeneity in reaction to shocks across emitter types, and that the top emitters seem to be more elastic. In terms of the literature I relate to, uh, in terms of the data and methods first, well, there is a research showing that we need to better understand the heterogeneity in carbon footprint to better address it. And to do that, there is a crucial need for fine-grained data because there is uh, heterogeneity in everyone's behavior, but also uh, within um, budget items in terms of the products you choose and also the volumes you consume, right? So to do that, I'm going to uh, perform a systematic matching and derive household emission intensity. In terms of the context, uh, this relates to a uh, paper uh, looking at public policies that could uh, curb food emissions. And here, uh, the crucial point is studying uh, emission heterogeneity, so how households who are in the top emitting quartile in our case are going to differ from households in lower emitting quartiles. Then um, in terms of 
the literature again, there is um, a question, a big matter of how purchasing power shock can affect food purchases. And here we know that food is actually a key adjustment margin for households because it represents um, it is composed of a lot of different items that individually cost little, but ha can have very different intensities. Um, and there is, and here I'm putting this paper that is a bit provocative, showing by uh, Christopher Rom, showing that recessions can be good for your health. Uh, of course, we don't want recessions, but still we could wonder how they can affect um, the planet emissions. So turning that... Turning now to the data I'm using in this paper, I'm using uh, household scanner level data. So for France, uh, for 2017-2019. So this is a very large data. Uh, it's about 7,000 households. They represent about 14 million transactions. And we have information about the purchase characteristics. So this is at the transaction level. Every time a household purchases a product, we know all the characteristics of it. And uh, the social demographics of the households obtained at the yearly level that we're going to exploit for heterogeneity analysis. And uh, this is food at home data, and we can discuss the limitation of that later. In terms of the environmental data, uh, it's from the French environment, and I'm using the French setting um, because uh, we have here access to uh, specific data that reflect French food habits and supply conditions. And uh, the data also contains information about the raw ingredients, but also the processed uh, food products. And this is important because food pro processed food products, and especially ultra processed food products, represent a large share of households' uh, daily consumption. Uh, so we would like to know what is their intensity. The key measure we're going to use here as a quite standard is the climate change in kilo uh, CO2 equivalent per kilo purchased. Just a clarification, yes. what does life cycle analysis refer to in the sort of second line? Or... Um, so life cycle analysis is basically from the production to the consumption of the product. So from the beginning of the product's life to, the, to its end of life. So uh, for every step, we know how much uh, the product emits, for instance, depending on uh, the production conditions and then uh, yeah. how it's uh, cooked, et cetera. Right. So it does not then include anything. For example, I purchase a potato and I boil it at my home. So it would not include the boiling part. It would only include... It does. It does include the boiling part as well. Yes, so obviously it's uh, more standardized than that. So we assume that potatoes are cooked one way and that's an average. So okay. we don't really know whether you boil it or you put it to your Right, right. I see. It's not that detailed. Uh, but it's, it's actually the best we have at this stage. And uh, I should also mention uh, that this doesn't, uh, we have no information to the best of my knowledge about sourcing for now, because this usually is a proprietary uh, data that no one really has. So it's standardized food product. So one potato in France is just one potato. There's not much more detail than that. But it's quite detailed in the sense that uh, if you think of uh, orange juice, you have with and without pulp. So that's how we use it. Yeah. And maybe painfully American, but does that include packaging? <laughs> yes, okay. it, um, oh. it does include uh, packaging, freezing on the uh, retail process. So it's quite, uh, it's a uh, to, I think it's one of the best uh, and most detailed data that there is, but um, I'm not going to go into that, but basically I'm matching those data together using machine learning tools. And uh, the key restriction here is like how uh, detailed the environmental impact data is. So as soon as we're going to get better data, it will be possible to redo the matching and have more detailed information. Yes. Can you distinguish a local potato versus imported? Yeah. So again, uh, we have no information about sourcing. So a potato would be probably an average of like. It's probably like 70% French potato and 30% yeah, British potato. Right? I don't know. Yeah. It's more likely to be sourced from abroad, just not a particular potato. Where exactly. So it accounts, there's some kind of weighting uh, in the process. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, reflecting uh, food consumption and supply, but um, it's not as easy. So if you're purchasing uh, beef from New Zealand, we're not going to be able to differentiate it from French beef. However, uh, in the case of food, transportation plays a very little role, and we can discuss that if you want. Um, just a quick question. Are you going to think about distortions created on the nutrition side of the equation? No, I'm not quite there yet, but uh, yeah, I have uh, this data, uh, this environmental data is uh, um, conveniently enough, perfectly matched with uh, nutritional data, so we can do that now. That's yeah, because really you're addressing the carbon externality, but of course. Yeah, food. so for yeah. today, we're going to focus on um, the environmental side of things, but uh, that's definitely uh, something I want to look at in the uh, next steps of the paper. Thank you. Um, so basically, uh, in terms of the data output, what we have from this machine learning uh, method that I'm not going to detail today, uh, but for the ones who are interested in supervised machine, machine learning, uh, for any observed transaction in the purchase data, we have the purchase date that I then aggregate for computational reasons, detailed purchase information, the environmental impact, and household information. And using that, we're going to be able to derive a bunch of status facts in order to better understand how food emissions are distributed. So first, uh, what, what happens in terms of the products? Well, there is a large heterogeneity in terms of uh, product categories. Uh, it's not too surprising that red meat is uh, way more polluting than the rest of the product, but still the magnitude is perhaps interesting. It's about four times more polluting than the next category that is also an animal product. It's other meat containing uh, cold cuts and every uh, mixed meat you can think of. So you don't you don't count methane at all, or is it like transform it? It is to... transform. It is why we say equivalent. Okay. Uh, so I think in that How setting, much of it is, is it's about roughly a uh, thirty uh, one unit of methane would represent thirty kilo of CO two. So it's right there. I'm not sure, but how much of that bar there is like due to the methane thing, and how much is due to other CO two emissions in the process of ah uh, um. Stuff? So for red meat, it would be much bigger in terms of methane, obviously. Uh, but uh, in terms of the decomposition, I don't have it in my in the top of my head, and I don't. But um, yeah, I'd say most of red meat is due to methane, obviously. Um, and then in terms, uh, but this heterogeneity across categories is also hiding important heterogeneity within categories that I'm gonna exploit in the paper. Um, and here you might be surprised by the fact that this other beverage category uh, has a lot more heterogeneity. So I should first say that the red bars are representing the 10th and 19th uh, percentiles of the distribution for each category. And this is due uh, to how I group my categories. They more or less represent supermarket buys. And this uh, one, here, uh, other beverage represents both water and coffee, which is high. Uh, coffee is very high and water ranks low. Um, so this is the kind of heterogeneity we're going to be able to explore to better understand how emissions are distributed within the French population. And here uh, is how they are distributed. So here I'm plotting a cumulative um, function of emissions. So in the x-axis, you have the yearly emission, so it's the household average in ton, uh, equivalent for per consumption unit. And what you can see here is mainly that um, there is the distribution is skewed, that some people, uh, some households seem to be consuming about twice as much as the rest of the population. And uh, I guess this is where we'd like to change food demand or better understand what is going on. So who are those households? And if we think uh, in very simple terms, we could maybe decompose the population into four core types of emitters. So just playing the population using the cumulative um, density. So I'm just gonna show you uh, science facts using those quartiles of emitters. And what we see here 
as that edge uh, seems to be an important um, a driver or correlated with higher emissions and education uh, is less uh, is also negatively correlated with emissions but there is there is no uh, correlation with income in that case are these equivalized households so obviously you know younger households more likely to have kids yeah so you you controlled yeah, it's controlled for, and uh, I only have five minutes left, but if you're interested, I can... Uh, it's controlled for. Yeah, it's controlled for, yes, <laughs> of course. Um, so once we have that, and I'm going to rush a little bit because I'm a bit a touch short on time, uh, we know that uh, income doesn't seem to be a key predictor of emissions, and we would like now to better understand uh, if, yes, there is no difference in terms of the levels, uh, based on income, but maybe there will be uh, react differences in reaction in terms uh, of how people react to purchasing power shocks. So basically, what are the elasticities to prices and expenses? So here I'm using a demand model, and the key objective is to um, put a bit more structure in how in households' uh, food consumption. So basically, we're going to group uh, products into food categories and see how people uh, change the composition of their food basket when there is a shock, either on prices or expenditure, and both can represent um, purchasing power shocks. So for that, I'm um, using a demand model. It's a simple, um, um, almost ideal demand system model from uh, Ditton and Bauer. And basically, what we want uh, to predict here is uh, the budget share. And uh, the budget share uh, for every category depends on prices, the P here, and uh, an expenditure term that represents uh, household food expenditure, as well as some uh, demand shifters that can be controlled variables and some fixed. So basically what we're mainly interested in is capturing those gamma and beta effects because they represent the price effects or the price reaction uh, of the demand to changes uh, in price per category. And uh, in terms of the estimate we are getting in this model at um, here, so the first column is just the estimated budget share per category just so you have a rough idea of how uh, households demand, uh, food demand is distributed. The second column would represent uh, the expenditure elasticity and the third one, the price elasticity. And what we can see here, the first thing is probably that red meat uh, seems to be more reactive to, um, more elastic to price changes, which can be a good thing uh, if you think in terms of uh, policy matter because it suggests uh, that people are quite elastic to, to, change, uh, to change in the price of red meat. But what we are perhaps more interested in is better understand how uh, those households uh, react along the distribution of emissions and whether they differ. And for that, we needed to find a good predictor of households' emissions. And as we've seen, income is, doesn't seem to be a good predictor. Age uh, could be one, but it's only a weak predictor. And targeting people uh, based on their age is probably not super relevant. So I'm using uh, ex ante emissions with the idea that if you, uh, in the past, you were a big uh, meat consumer, for instance, you're going to remain one uh, in the present. And that has the advantage of being quite exogenous and strongly correlated with your current level of emissions. And um, here is what we obtained just looking at the bottom and uh, the top emitting quartile. That the top emitting quartile seem, households in that quartile seem to be more reactive to any change in price for any category, but they are mainly more reactive in the case of red meat, uh, suggesting that there might be strong heterogeneity in how people react to changes in price and um, 
potential difference and uh, preferences between the bottom uh, households in the bottom emitting quartiles and households in the top emitting quartile. And I'm going to wrap it now. So in this paper, I'm trying to quantify heterogeneity in pre-emissions, providing evidence from friends uh, using fine matching of purchase data and environmental data. I'm showing that there is strong heterogeneity uh, for a good that is consumed by everyone um, in, uh, uh, in their daily lives. I'm then studying reactions to prices and expenditure variations, estimating changes in the composition of food baskets for now only across categories, and we can discuss uh, what happens within categories, showing that there is important heterogeneity in reaction to shops across emitter types. And the next steps will be uh, building contractual scenarios, obviously predicting how this heterogeneity in reaction can affect the amount and the distribution of emissions. For that, I intend to use uh, food inflation, the recent observed shocks, as well as tax stimulations, and we will be able to see as well the nutritional impact. Thank you very much.